Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben. Welcome back to another episode. And Cody, uh, the Oscars, baby. What a night. <laughs> it Oppenheimer was, uh, cleaned yeah. up. What do you think? I mean, I, I don't know how deep in the weeds people want to get in this. I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan in general. Isn't this, a, this isn't an Oscars podcast. We're not doing an immediate live reaction to the Academy's stodgy picks. I, th- <laughs> I think people actually come here clamoring to hear from us, Ben. They want to know what Christopher Nolan takes. They want to know if we think that this is the, the apex movie achievement of the last decade. Uh, I'm a little cooler on Oppenheimer in general than, uh, but then apparently the the Academy. I should interesting be interesting an choice voter. of words there. Being yeah. cooler on Oppenheimer. <laughs> yes, continue. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, you know, blow up my mind when I oh saw the whole God, thing. Oh my God! What are you doing right now? No, it's a, it's a good spoilers, movie. Spoilers! Spoilers! You know what? You know this. This is kind of this a spoiler. Is, you know what this is like. This is like when I went to see Titanic and someone outside was talking about how the boat sank, and I was like, I can't. I'm, I just walked out. I didn't even go see it. I do have to say that the countdown, there's a countdown scene when, when they're testing the bomb, right? It, like, everyone knows, everyone in the world knows, like, what happens and how this all turns out. But somehow but that 30 rate. seconds, that's mm-hmm. that's some of the best cinema, like, period. If they could give an Oscar to, like, the best scene of the year, I probably would hand it out to that. It's between that and, like, the the push sing-along in Barbie. I think that's maybe the funniest scene I've seen in, in a decade. Uh, those are those are my top two scenes that I saw in the last year. But yeah, whatever. Oppenheimer's great. I, I'm not a voter, so no one really cares about my opinion. So you were you were watching Ryan Gosling last night instead of the basketball oh. <laughs> that was taking place, right? I mean the the, the I am Ken performance. Um, that reminds me. That reminds me. By the way, all of Cody's takes should be cow. I just need to say this. I have to say this at this point. Cody has not seen Dune two yet. So when he makes absolute statements like that, just keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> You know what? Last week, I think it was last week. I've completely lost track of time. I think we were talking about the Celtics. Was that last week? Yes, that was. Have they won a game since then? Is that? Wow, is that a real thing that's happened? I thought they won a game. I thought they won a game. They they beat Phoenix. Okay. Does that count? Is Phoenix one of those teams that the wins don't count anymore? Oh my God, Ben! You can't start off like that. Are you really that low on Phoenix right now? Are you that low on them? I'm just, I was asking. I'm just asking questions, Cody. I'm just a person asking questions. Yeah. You know, while, while we're just like throwing shade like this, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm always, I'm particular about what teams I watch. And if I really want to scout a player, um, if I want to scout a team or a player, I avoid all games where they play the Hawks because it feels like anytime there's like a big <laughs> Hawks game. No, I'm, I, nothing against the Hawks. It's just all of their games end up being like 140 to 130. It's the same thing with the Pacers. Like if I'm trying to really get a good idea of what a team looks like, I don't watch them against the Hawks or the Pacers. Unless I'm trying to scout the Hawks or the Pacers. It's nothing against them. It's just the track meet kind of, mm, it changes yes. exactly what it's going for. So I don't know if the Suns are kind of in that category for you. Just it's like, oh, I wonder what this team would look like if they went against like half a, or three quarters of a center out there and some like backup men it's from Kevin Durant. Who, yeah, you can rim protect, but you don't want Kevin Durant playing the five too much. I, I don't know if that's what you're saying. No, you know what I love? I love the idea of like an online argument breaking out about like PJ Tucker's offense and someone starts grabbing. He's like, PJ Tucker, 22 points against the Hawks. Unstoppable <laughs> offensive machine. He has like actual dribbling. Like he dribbles and scores at the basket after dribbling. Um, no shade toward PJ Tucker. He's just... Sp- speaking of online discourse, Ben, I don't know if you want to. No, wanna... don't do it. Okay. Don't do it. Okay. Don't do it. Are you go-, go ahead. Yeah. You. I'll give you 37 seconds to try to figure out, make sense of what you're going to say. Okay. <laughs> to, every, to anybody that is participating or adjacent to or just like in the same ballpark as this Jordan versus LeBron takes the like 90s discourse stuff that's going on. The one person that like tweeted something that was like, look at this 222 pound guard giving Michael Jordan the business. And it's Clyde Drexler. It is dream team player. <laughs> I can't, Clyde are, they, Drexler. are they parodies or not? I can't tell the other I don't one. I think that, so. The other, okay. But the other one I saw said, look at this competition they had to play in the finals. And it was John Stockton. And I was like, that's a hall of fame. <laughs> I'm so confused. I feel like it's a parody. I feel like it's gone to the next level and it's trying to trick people into thinking that being a 222 pound, six foot seven guy that can dunk from the free throw line is bad. That's what I've, I think we've moved into the ironic internet. It's web 3.0. That's what they're calling it. 
I don't think, Ben, I just think it's so glaringly stupid that people might view it as being ironic, but I genuinely think some of these people are, like, seriously making this argument. And my, my take is just, like, most takes you see on Twitter just do not exist. They are not real takes. Like, I think the place is overrun by bots. I think the place is overrun by <laughs> content farming, what reaction like, farming, and trying like to get as much engagement as possible. <laughs> it's, it's just it's like avoid- a corner store. Yeah, just I know love the people. Okay, here's the thing. Look, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we gotta we gotta rein the show back in. We gotta rein the show back in. There is a serious point here about the Celtics. Okay? okay, there's a serious point. It's that last time we we were trying to find weaknesses with the Celtics, we looked at a bunch of different things, and one of the filters I noticed that we never got to during that recording that I immediately shared with you right afterwards was I like to look at records versus top eight teams. It's not a huge sample. You only get like 20 games, maybe at the end of the year, 25 games or something like that. But that is something that I really enjoy looking at. And the Celtics, that's kind of the area where when you look at them, you're like, statistically, you've got all this, you've got this most beautiful portfolio statistically that you could possibly imagine. You might win 65 plus games. You have the greatest point differential since Secretariat. Um, He's a horse, by the way, in case anyone's wondering. (laughs) And then, like, you look at how they perform against top eight teams, and it's not bad, but also right now, as of right now, as of the top eight teams on our win pace board, Boston is seven of seven, seven of seven, seven and seven, seven wins, seven losses. Basketball should have more flowery language of this stuff. You know, in baseball, they'd be like seven. They come into the game seven up and seven down. They have all these, Mm. you know, turns of phrases for seven wins, seven losses, basically dead even point differential. And like from that perspective, teams like the Pelicans and the Lakers um, technically have been better. But they're, when you just say who's, who's playing well against the top competition in the league, the Celtics look fine, but they haven't broken away. And I thought that was an interesting thing this week because fresh off that show, of course, they lose to the Cavs. Uh, they lose to Dean Wade, who I believe single-handedly hit all of the shots in the fourth quarter to come back from like 22 points or something. Then the awesome game, one of the best regular season games of the year against the Nuggets. And you can obviously see the Nuggets create all kinds of matchup problems for everybody around the league, probably. So then all of a sudden they have two losses and it's like that that's the thing maybe with Boston, where if you could poke a hole statistically, it's how are they performing against the best teams in the league? I forgot because I know we, we talked about this a little bit last week. Who are the teams that are performing the best against the top eight? Uh, the Thunder. The okay. Thunder are the best. They are 14 and six with a nice juicy point differential. Mm. And then you kind of have this glut of teams because when you play the very best teams, being around or above 500 is pretty good. Uh, Minnesota, the Pelicans, Celtics, Lakers, Nuggets, Bucks are all kind of in that area. Um, even the Pacers, although the, the point differential is terrible, but even the Pacers are around 500 against top teams. I want to ask you about a team. I want to mm. know how they're performing there. Yes. Uh, what what do the Warriors look like when they're playing top eight teams? I have a Ooh. bad feeling you're going to tell me they're like one in, one in ten or something like that. Can we come back to that? Yeah, let's come back to that. Can you ask me about that later? I will try and remember that. Or or we could do it now because I have a I have a... I have an important thing to get to that we were supposed to do last show or maybe Ooh. two shows ago. I can't remember it. It's an update on our uh, the offense in the league and the officiating. If anyone hasn't noticed, defense is back, baby. The offensive ratings. Cody, you know what the offensive rating was last month? What was it? All the way down to a pathetic teeny little 115. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And if you're keeping, okay. if you're keeping track, we... Um, we passed 110 in a month in 2017, just a very brief blip. It was just teasing us. And then we got over you know, 110 in every month, basically, around 2019, 2020, the bubble, the post-lockout. And then if you recall, we had that uh, points of emphasis from the officials at the beginning of the 2021-22 season, and offensive rating finally went back under 110 coinciding with that was fewer fouls being called on shots on drives. Uh, You had a little bit more physicality. The defense was actually allowed to play. We did that. um, One of my favorite videos we've ever done on Alex Caruso and Lonzo Ball just blowing up the point of attack. And then that kind of went away. And ever since then, Cody, we've been living in like 
113, 115, 117. Our last couple months in the NBA, 2023, March and April, 117. Uh, to start this season, 115. December, 118. January, 117.1. And then, hold on, hold on. We have gone back to 115 in February. We are in 115 in March. And not coincidentally, this is completely coincided. It's correlated almost perfectly with the drop in shooting fouls called on two-point shots, the metric we've talked about multiple times on this show. We've done multiple episodes. I think we have an enhanced podcast about this trend historically where when you look at the the sort of ebbing and flowing of how they call these foul, fouls, it will move offensive, offensive rating up or down. Teams are so skilled. They're so smart. It's not the whole story, but... It is a factor, and I always am fascinated how you can see it in the immediate short term. Like, they made that change in 2022. Boom, offensive rating drops at the beginning of the season. They loosen up the change, and they go back to calling all these fouls the second anyone, you know, drives and falls down. Offensive rating spikes back through the roof, and now it's spiking and and looks like we might go to 120 this year. And no, all of a sudden, they pull the wool over our eyes. And when I watched the film in the last month, they are specifically allowing certain kinds of contact on drives. They're not necessarily calling it an offensive foul, but you're getting a lot more like no calls where players are like smashing into each other. And um, yeah, that's that's the update. That's really interesting because if I'm not mistaken, offensive rating usually goes up throughout the season. Like you start into the last exactly. few months and... Yeah, we see like a yeah. multiple point bump, like you said, last season it ended like 117 or whatever crazy number it got to. Now, you sort of touched on it right there. Like what sorts of plays specifically do you think this there seems to be more of clamping down on where they're not calling it? Like is it the like the Dame Lillard kind of thing where you're like driving, you jump into the person or like the Trey Young where you kind of try and jump into is that being called less or are there other points where you're seeing these calls not being called as much? It's a little bit of that. The league just put out on their Twitter account, the NBA refs put out some points of emphasis that they're working on right now. So I would say there's probably more, but just off the top of my head, one is that move that I I really don't understand what we're doing where the offensive player is driving the defensive player is sliding with them and the offensive player tries to truck them and run into them with their shoulder I think that should be an offensive foul but I'm seeing a lot more no calls so you have like collisions for players driving to the basket and it's a no call Um, part of the points of emphasis is they talked about hooking. We're starting to see that called an offensive foul a lot more. So if you're Dame Lillard and you're driving to the left and you have a little space and the big man's coming off the screen and you see that arm out there, he takes his off arm that's not dribbling and he tries to wrap it and hook it and then falls down. They're calling that an offensive foul Hmm. now. Um, I think there was one more in the point of emphasis that has now escaped me. But it's it's just a few areas like that where you make some changes and you almost like you have to think about it as like taking away some of the tricks and toolkits for some of these offensive players. And then as we said, last time we talked about this and I think at this point in time, it's super important to bring back up because I know there's a lot of disagreement about this. I know certain people in the analytics community or JJ Redick or people like that have pushed back on some of these things that we're saying. And it's like when the players learn on the fly to adapt you're not necessarily going to see a massive change in overall free throws or overall fouls because they tune themselves very quickly to how the game is played. If you think about FIBA, the NBA players go over there, they look foolish for a couple games, and then they realize like we can't do that anymore. And the downstream effects of we can't do that anymore are things like I can't get into the paint for a drive and kick. So you're not going to see that in like a foul. You're going to see the offensive rating go down because – the, the guy guarding you now can contain you. The defense doesn't collapse. It isn't swung around the perimeter. And what goes down, Cody? Like your three-point shooting, your offensive rating, and your assist numbers, all because they let somebody guard differently or they called something different at the point of attack. So in terms of why we might want to care about this, do you think it's that much of a shift that we're really going to see any significant changes this season or are you just happy to see some kind of movement back in this direction and it makes you think like oh okay maybe going forward season by season we might see a a legitimate change as we go forward I don't know how much the NBA wants to get away from the offensive explosion I I think um, you know if you just even take a macroscopic picture and say over the last 40 years expanding dribbling rules 
I have a lot to say about the gather step and we'll, we'll save that for another time. But just, just think about the gather step allows you to do things in basketball that you couldn't do for the first hundred X years of like, it really opens up a new world when you think about like, think about the whole dynamic of like the Euro and someone sliding over to take a charge and how the heck do you defend this? Because the players are realizing like, I'm keeping my dribble as alive as long as legally possible as the ball comes back off the floor and then I'm starting to do my dance steps but I haven't even picked it up yet because I haven't gathered once I gather Cody then I can hop pause hop the other way I mean look I'm breaking stuff in this room right now I, this is what happens when you when you start using the gather dribble so um, stuff like that macroscopically I think has opened the game up in a way that they probably don't want to change but Going forward, at least in the immediate short term, I'm fascinated to see what happens in the playoffs mm. because we see we talk about this all the time. If you allow more physicality in the playoffs, if you take away, if you like stop calling these sort of um, foul baiting moves, we talked about this with specific players. Like I'm fascinated to see how Shea Gilgis Alexander is officiated in the playoffs as an example of a star player who gets a lot of free throws and sort of has his own little set of tricks. He doesn't get as much criticism, I think, from the common folk because there's so much other stuff going on with his game. But uh, and, he, and he does it differently than other players. But as an example, you mentioned Dame. Like, Shea is one of the kings of... I'm going to use my off arm as I drive. I'm driving into you. I, f I feel the contact that I may have created with my off arm, and now I'm falling down and I'm getting free throws. I don't know how much they're going to like rein that back in because even on a play like that, continuation, as an example, is something that makes a huge difference if you call the foul on the floor versus just that automatic, like, all I had to do was start driving and I get free throws. You know, you, you just gave me a great idea. I mean, if we really want to rile people up, we could do an episode or a segment where you just rank, like, which players do we think are going to be most impacted by some of these changes when they get to the playoffs? And let me tell you, like, whatever names we put there, uh, the people would be mad. The people would be angry. This was your idea? Your idea was to do something that would make everyone as angry as humanly possible? Yeah, maybe that's the mood today. Maybe that's that's the vibe we want to go for. But maybe maybe we should pair it back. Maybe we should celebrate the players. It's like, you know what? Here's who we're actually going to – here's who's going to thrive in this kind of environment. Because you look at some of the bigger, the bulkier types of defenders, and I think they're the ones that start thriving. Maybe those are the guys we should celebrate. We should point to some dudes and be like, hey, we're not taking away skill from these guys. We're adding to what these guys are able to do if you allow a little bit more physicality. So that's that's the mindset shift that I need to take on this day, Ben. I just want to give defense a chance yeah. as well. Is that too much to ask? No. We, we need yeah. more defense, man. I th uh, speaking of defense, like I, I didn't watch the game, but let me tell you, if, if it was my way, you and I would be doing just a full-blown breakdown of the 73-79 76ers-Knicks game. Because in terms of just Apex games, that's, that's unbelievable. We need at least a couple of these a season. I think I saw somebody uh, tweet out, some information about how often this happens. I don't remember the last time it happened. It was almost like a decade since there was a game when both teams, when neither team crested 80 points. And then it went all the way back in like in 2004. There were like 20 games where neither team crested 80 points. I'm like, wow, how things have changed in 20 years, Ben. Th this is on Twitter, the website that you believe is not real. Is that okay. right? Okay, you, did, you didn't let me finish my point. So oh, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna, yeah. That's an invitation to finish my point. <laughs> is I was going to say, use Twitter by finding the people you trust and looking at that information. I think that's how Twitter can be used really well, is try not to get baited in by these kinds of ridiculous posts that want people to get in and interact with them. Follow the people that consistently give out good information, and that's a good way to disseminate that information. So it is a tool that can be used, but like any tool, Ben, uh, it can have a blade on the other end of that sword. You're saying with great power comes great something. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Twitter is Spider-Man, Ben. Twitter is Spider-Man. With great now, power now comes great silly. responsibility. That's, that's, um, that's what you're quoting. That's is that what, what I'm quoting? Is that Uncle Ben? That's, yeah, that's Uncle Ben. Look, just being okay. silly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I haven't slept in days. I don't know what's happening. Uh, the, the, you asked me earlier. I did. About the Golden State Warriors. Yep. How do they perform against the top eight teams in the league? Yep. They are 5-19. and 19 Oh, my God. Against the top eight teams. It is extremely difficult for the Golden State Warriors to defeat good basketball teams. Hmm. And I will uh, just throw that your way because I think, you know, you, something to discuss there. I just, I don't know what it is, Ben. I think it's 
we've talked about the Warriors, and I think we wrote their eulogy like last year and things like that. But I feel like I can't quit them too much. Like Draymond Green came back from his suspension, and you know, despite some stuff, some of the extracurriculars he gets into still. Draymond's just a genius level basketball player Mm -hmm. and watch the Warriors play and some of the stuff he does out there it makes me want to it makes me want to cheer for them more and tell the world that I believe in them as a sneaky championship like dark horse just because I want to watch the Warriors play more basketball but then basically like any statistical measure that you look at it's it's the complete opposite it's like there's absolutely no oh 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 there's one oh (laughs) there's one Dr. Strange tell me what that is Ben Yes, out of all out of all the possibilities, out of all the statistics that could be indicators for this team, they all look like doomsday except for one path. There is one way through. Okay. Okay. In the last month, Stephen Wardell Curry, mm-hmm. when he's been on the court, the Golden State Warriors are plus eight point five. Hey. Now, just in the last that, month, is that unbelievable? It, no, that's like top ten percentile or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just in the last month, we could oh. get it for the whole season uh, in a second. We could look that up on. Well, we've got our stats department on. Yeah, it, me, we could look it up. I'll call <laughs> basketball dot net on our yep. stats board for our subscribers. Um, but I think this is this is the path, and to me, and probably to you, I don't know how people listening feel, especially if they're on this imaginary website of yours. That, I don't see Golden State as being in the content. We haven't talked about them in the contender circle all year. No. But this, these teams in the West, Cody, and maybe even something brewing in the East, depending on who's healthy, like I am fascinated by a team that could win a series, make an upset, even have a second round series. Like the 1994 Denver Nuggets, baby, mm. knocking <laughs> off the Sonics and then taking the Jazz to seven games. So what if they were down 3 nothing? They got it back to 3-3. One of the only teams to ever do that. Like... I'm re- I, some of these teams in the West are fascinating. Golden State might be the most fascinating to me for a team that could actually pull off like a playoff upset and maybe make a run is a quote unquote run is a word that implies like multiple rounds. I guess if they had the right matchup, they could win two rounds. Ra- like I, that's where they are to me. But any of these teams kind of being able to do that would be really fun. But the Warriors. I, they might be the one if I had to pick one. Yeah, I think the the thing that stands out to me when I watch the Warriors, I I think about Matt Ben. I need to sit down and do this study at some point because I think there's some kind of untapped information that we can be getting about how valuable kick ahead and outlet passes are. And as far as I'm concerned, I can't find like publicly available data about players throwing outlet passes or kick aheads, about teams throwing outlet passes. And yet, every time I see a team or a player like maximize using them, it just gets so much more value value out of everyone on the team. Like immediately, I think of Luka Doncic. I think Luka Doncic is just a preeminent outlet passer. Uh, Nikola Jokic, obviously. Tyrese Halliburton's really good at kicking ahead. But the Warriors as a team are so good at pushing the pace. And I think a lot of that has to do with Draymond Green. Like on one hand, he kind of has this like, you know, he obviously grabs and goes and he's been so good at that for years. So he gets it and just brings it up himself. But when he gets it, he is so confident. He is so gutsy with some of his passes that he throws them. And I'm like, there's no chance that's going to work out. And the fact that he's always kind of pushing at the seams really pushes their offense in a way that makes them chaotically difficult to stop. Right. I'm thinking about the Knicks game recently. I didn't count but I thought about it after like four or five outlet passes in the first quarter. And I'm like, oh my God, the Knicks are just like, they have no idea how to handle the Warriors pushing the pace in this way. And when I watch them being able to push it up and somebody like, let's say a Pajemski, I really messed it up. Pajemski, Pajemski. I'm going to do it one more time. Pajemski or your Clay Thompson or your Steph Curry and you're catching it and you have like a moment of space while the transition D comes back, everyone's just completely scrambled. The paint might open up for a second while somebody's able to cut in. You have Andrew Wiggins, who might be trailing on the play, who's super athletic and can throw it down or finger roll from the free throw line. I don't know. That's the one part of their game that when I watch it, I'm like, I don't know if a team pushes the quote-unquote pace quite like the Warriors do. Wow. That was... That was a lot. I went into a trance when you were (laughs) going through that. Um, I probably broke it when I just forgot how to say Pajemski's name. Pajemski. 
Pachemski, yeah. Pachemski. I, yeah. I was just in the... You know how you like, you're really talking and you're going... Maybe not you because you don't talk as quickly as I do. Sometimes I just get into this this crazed state where I can, words I can come talk out. quickly. I, I talk slow so people can understand or at least have a chance of understanding what I'm attempting to say. <laughs> what's yeah. attempting to come out of my brain. Yeah. I'll speed it up though. You want me to speed it up? No, speed don't, it up. don't speed it up. No, yeah. we, we only have space for one just like chaotic talker on this. Well, podcast. I kind of feel like sometimes you want to mess with the people who play their podcast really fast <laughs> to see if you can mess with their head. <laughs> I'm a fast podcaster, by the way. I definitely what speed listen. do you podcast at? Well, Apple Podcast only lets me go in like sections of 0.25, so I end up doing 1.5. Uh, 1.75 okay. is just a little above my my listening ability. Okay, all right, mm-hmm. fair enough. I think that's fine. Yeah. So. Yeah, l- like my pushing the podcast. W- what do you think about that? Do you feel like the Warriors? Am I onto something here? Are the Warriors like particularly good at this? I know the Kings are good at pushing the pace. I know the Pacers are good at pushing the pace. I know individual players like Luka Doncic is good at pushing the pace. Am I off base when it comes to the Warriors and the value of outlet passes? Well, first of all, I want to protect you from the trolls because somebody right now is getting mad about you saying Luka Doncic pushing pace. Because, of course, in the half court, he's so slow and controls so much yeah, pace. Absolutely. Cody is speaking specifically to the idea of the hit-ahead pass. Mm-hmm. And not a lot of players will make them. But sometimes what you see, and and uh, I think you sent me one the other day with Luca, or I sent you one with Luca. I, I sent you one with Luca. We got this all backwards. Mavs get the rebound. And this is not your Wes Unseld, Bill Walton, sexy highlight film like Larry Bird outlet down for the layup. This is, I have the ball in my own paint and I throw it 40 feet to the half court line. Mm -hmm. And the key thing happening there is you are stressing the defense immediately by putting it at a live ball handler who's way ahead of the play. And it's like, now are we going to cross match? Are we going to switch? How are we going to match up? Uh, is Is it a little four on three? It wouldn't have been a four on three if you didn't hit it ahead. But the hit ahead opens that. So I would love to see that study. I, this ties into my whole thing about how transition basketball is not measured statistically very well at all. Like, I don't think anybody has any idea what's going on in transition from a statistical <laughs> standpoint. Uh, they, they're very lost. You see, like, all these transition stats, a lot of them are based on the shot clock. That's okay, but I mean, like, you know, it doesn't differentiate between a pick six and, you know, when the defense is set and semi-transition and drag screens. There's a lot going on there. Anyway, that aside... Um, Hit aheads are great. They're super cool. The Warriors, I think, have always had that with players like Green. I think the more high IQ players and the more ball handlers you can have to unlock that kind of semi transition early offense action. Because to to the whole point of this, and I think the plays you're thinking of, if you keep it in the backcourt in those situations, then you would just end up with five on five basketball. And the hit ahead gives you that like, oh, da- oh, we didn't know we had a three on two on this side of the court. <laughs> Now, at least the defense has to recover and you can do something. That's what's really cool about them. And that's what we all look forward to after you spend the next six months studying these things. And um, don't you don't have to worry about raising your family and all that stuff, right? No, no, not at all. I think I'm just going to dive right in and just stay up here in my basement attic and study, <laughs> study the kick ahead pass, Ben. I think that is my <laughs> destiny, is to figure out just how valuable this, this play is. Only the YouTube listeners will have any idea what that <laughs> reference is, the basement attic that Cody broadcasts live from Earth. Um, okay, so what are we saying about Golden State? Let's get back on track here. Are you we're asking sure? me that? Oh, yeah, I thought, I thought was that a... was a lead in. I thought you were like, what are we saying? And then no, you were going to say asking, something about I'm that. I'm asking you where we are because I, I – so right now, as of recording this, Steph Curry has an injured ankle. Yeah. I believe it's not thought to be too bad, right? So he'll miss a little time and then he'll come back. But here's what I'm seeing and the reason why I think they might be – out of all the like playoff adjacent, we're battling for a spot kind of teams, they're certainly, they're certainly the most interesting with their pedigree. Mm-hmm. But they also might be able to have a high high end gear. Let's put it that way. That could get the right matchup or could catch the right team in the postseason and defeat them or be extremely difficult to eliminate. And the reason I'm saying that is if Andrew Wiggins can come back and he's and he's been back and like provide eighty or ninety percent or some kind of a simile of what he was two years ago, defense rebounding. And then shoot remote like like his shot was amazing in 2022, and now it's fallen off. Like now he can't shoot anymore. It's just it's something in the middle. And then you get the Jonathan Kuminga driving game, and maybe he could hold up as the fifth defender because of his athleticism in certain playoff matchups. So you get this 
winginess back from the Warriors. I love moving Clay Thompson to the bench. I actually like their bench now. Their bench, like, I actually don't think it's a great bench, but at least it's got stuff. It's got stuff going on there, right? Chris Paul and Clay Thompson mm-hmm. and guys like this, Kevon Looney coming off the bench. And then Pajemski, we just talked about it. We tried to say his name six times, but we also <laughs> just talked about it. Like, players who can shoot, live ball decision making, get downhill, um, and build that around the Curry Draymond thing, which is they're not at their peak anymore, but. That's still tough in a playoff series. Draymond Green is one of the smartest basketball players I've ever studied and watched in my entire life. He's still an elite defender. Uh, He pushes pace. And now he's shooting threes. Now, don't look at the sample. If you're at home, don't look at the sample. Don't pay attention to the fact that it's only like 80 threes, okay? What what is he he shooting, like 45% from three this season? It's really high. It's a ridiculous number. Yeah. So I think that entire package and the experience that they have could make for some very, very interesting matchups in the first round. Yeah. Okay. I I like the way that you're framing that. By the way, they have to get to the first round just just as a point of fact. Yeah, but go ahead. I like the way you frame that because, yeah, I don't don't see them as a Dark Horse championship contender. I I don't see them beating OKC in the series. I don't see them being Denver, uh, the Clippers. I don't see them beating those teams in a series. But I think back to last season, right? I think back to last season. They were the number six seed playing the Kings, and they go to seven games, and I know De'Aaron Fox gets injured. Was it just for the for game seven, or was the last couple games that Fox was? I think it might have just been game seven. It, it doesn't matter. Steph Curry drops 50 points in game seven, and the Warriors win. Kevon Looney also has 20 rebounds that game. R- ridiculous performance. But the point is, we finished that series, and nobody's like, the number three Kings blew it. Like, this is a complete choke job. No, everyone was like, valiant effort from the number three seed. That was incredible. I can't believe they pushed this old this old Warriors team to seven games, right? And I feel like they kind of still have a little bit of that punch. That if you end up in a first-round series with them and you don't have true championship aspirations, you better watch out because I do think they have the potential to really push you, maybe get into the second round to just cause a little bit of havoc there. Um I don't know. And I think what you touched on, I like the Chris Paul shout out too, because what Chris Paul and Draymond Green do, especially with a lot of these guys that are good play finishers, I think Jonathan Kaminga's a great play finisher. He had an enormous like pick and roll dunk, just like cocked it back. Someone was in the way, just throw just unbelievable athleticism. Uh, Jackson Davis, another guy that's like, you know, I, I like these kinds of like young dudes that can roll in there, throw down some blobs and stuff like that. These Andrew Wiggins, another one, these good athletic play finishers. When you put somebody like Draymond Green and you have somebody like Chris Paul, you have people that have the gravity of Clay Thompson and Steph Curry. That's a really dangerous brew you have where you can just kind of like all of a sudden throw this pass that nobody else would be able to make and make a shot out of nowhere. And I think that's where in the half court now, they're even deadlier than just in those transition opportunities. So I really like their passing game, especially from those two players combined with the shooting that Clay and, and Curry bring, of course. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that caught my ear when you said that, now again, I don't even know if they're going to make it into the bracket, mm-hmm. but I, I do think there are some teams at the top that they could beat in a playoff series. I saw you yeah. make a face. Yes. I saw you make a face. Do you want to? Yes. Do you want to comment on on a team you made a face for? I I think the matchup with the Clippers fascinates me to no end. Oh wow! Because yes, yes, because of the construction of the teams and the winginess of the players. And so the Clippers have these wings that they like to play, and they're all switchy. And this is where the commit. This is where Wiggins is such a big deal. You get Wiggins, Kuminga, a little bench, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. Am I forgetting anyone? I mean, even Pajemski's not that small, right? Pajemski's, what is he, 6'5", 6'4"? Something like that. Moody is a big dude, too. And Moody, yes, and Moody plays as well, although I don't think Moody will get huge minutes in a, in a rotation there. But there is something about that. And then Zubots, the, the Clippers are doing all sorts of fascinating things defensively. I haven't really thought too much about whether that would help in a series against Golden State and like really hurt them. Um, or really hurt the Warriors' offense. But as I as I talk through it now, actually, I think what the Clippers are trying to do defensively this season is more about protecting the paint and the rim. So it exposes you maybe a little bit to this kind of like high variance outside shooting that a Steph Curry team could provide. But as I say that, it's a Steph Curry team. But do the Warriors actually like do they do they look great in terms of the three point shooting and outside percentage as a team? We think of them that right way, right? 
I don't know if that's like I'm guessing the last month statistics is what you'd want to look like because I did well, pull the Steph Curry over the year, so I don't know what it looks like in the last month, but I don't know what their shooting is outside of like it's, the two guys. It's 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 th- they're third in the league in attempts and tenth in makes at thirty seven and a half. Sorry, tenth in percentage hmm. at thirty seven and a half percent. So so it's good. It's yeah. good, but to your point, like if you're in the last month and things are starting to look even better, and Clay Thompson's shot is looking even better, and things like that, um, you know, then that might be an, like Andrew Wiggins, as we mentioned, if his shot's better, if Draymond Green's hitting his shot, that's where I think there might be some kind of like fire ice matchup potential where maybe you play Zubots off the court. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't know. There are some interesting things. Yeah. Okay, but then OKC Denver. You're a little, you're a little more skeptical of uh, Denver. I'm very skeptical. As as listeners, longtime listeners know, last year I I wanted the Nuggets and the Warriors to match up in the playoffs so I could pick the Nuggets in a in a thunderous um, a, a onslaught. Um, the OKC is interesting because of the youth. I think it can be maybe like mm. this is where Golden State's so interesting. You could talk yourself into stuff getting competitive yeah right i think that's the way to look at it like all of a sudden it's competitive and then you're dealing with this team that it's just like you got to chase steph curry around a ton you got to deal with draymond green you got to deal with their mass matchup versatility okc is probably too good but yeah it, it gets fun i don't know is we can do more warriors deep dive stuff here but i'm just actually curious if there's another team that you like better in this sort of like adjacent pod of teams in the west can I can I shout out a couple of things here? That, that there's a couple of Warriors things I want to get off my chest that I want to get out there publicly. I haven't heard a lot of people say these things, so I kind of want to zag, especially on one guy. Is it about your love for Jonathan Kaminga? No, it, you know what? Jonathan Kaminga is what he is, right? I, I don't love like the empty-sided isolations that he does. I'm not quite as excited a lot about a lot of people, but I do like his finishing ability, right? Like I said, when you pair him with spacers and passers, I think he brings some value in that side of role threat. Um, I... You kind of, you kind of, I, you know what? I don't, I don't even know how to phrase it. I'm gonna stop prefacing, and I'm just gonna say it. I'm, I'm secretly and like quietly buying stock in Moses Moody, Ben. Oh, just okay. like, just calling in, be like, hey, just a couple more shares here. I'd, li- I'd like a little bit more here. Uh, I like Moses Moody quite a bit, and I think the thing with Moses Moody is you look at some of the traditional stuff. Is he gonna really break the bank with creation? Not really. Is he gonna score a lot of points? Probably not. Is he going to space the floor traditionally for you? Nah, not at all. Not not at all, but not really. Shooting like 32%. But kind of everything else, like we talked about Kyle Lowry being the little things king. Moses Moody's a 6'6 dude that just does a lot of stuff out there. Like on the offensive glass, he's always fighting people down low. Uh, On defense, he's a big physical body. Like I'm thinking of a play against the Knicks, right? I forgot who drives in, but here he is in the paint. He's standing there and he's completely stopping the drive from happening. Ball gets kicked out too quickly. He closes out, quickly starting his jump shot. Moses Moody has both feet like at the elbow, like none of his feet are beyond the elbow. Two-footed jump blocks the jump shot. Mm. I'm like, this is a dude Mm. that if we do get into a playoff battle, I want him out there, right? And I'm sure there's stuff that's going to help him like probably get played off the court sometimes. You're like, all right, we need somebody that can actually get some buckets of Steph Curry's on the bench or something like that. But in terms of just doing all the other stuff, and if I am a playoff team, Ben, I want Moses Moody on my team. I think he has a really interesting career ahead of him based on what I've been seeing this season. Do you know how old Moses Moody is? I don't. Do you want to take a guess? This is, this is You're making this me is, nervous now. I thought yeah. he's only been in the league for like three years, right? So I he, feel he, like... I think it's his third year. It feels like he's been around forever. Yeah. I, I was going to guess 22. He's 21. He's going to be 22 oh. in May. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're buying stock, there's still plenty of runway mm-hmm. for him to continue to grow as a player. And um, it, it's interesting just thinking about the legit depth of the Warriors. You know, mm-hmm. like one of the things we were talking about lately is this rubric that I use a lot, which is a finals player. Mm. Meaning how many players on a team would get finals minutes at that level of competition? You know, um, did I say that in a really awkward, weird way? It's basically no. when, when you get to the highest levels of basketball at the end of the season in a rotation, when the coach says, hey, we got to trim down to the seven, eight guys that we know we can play in this series. Who's, in, who's at that level? Who can play at a finals level rotation? Wow. And when you go through and you look through playoff rosters and you think about depth, I mean, 
even a team like Boston, as amazing as they are, I'm not sure how deep their finals rotation is when like push comes to shove. Luke Cornett's not going to be out there. I don't know if Sam Hauser's going to be out there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a team like the Warriors and we talk about their depth, you know, Dario Saric is technically a bench player there. Um, you mentioned Moses Moody, Chris Paul, Clay Thompson, Kev Kavon Looney, the Gauntlet, Gary Payton the second, I mean, Trace Trace Jackson Davis. That's that's like a dozen guys. How many of these guys are in the playoff? Let's start with the playoff rotation. How many of these guys do you think are going to be in the playoff rotation? Wow, they have they have to make the playoffs first. This is I know. What are they? The tenth seed? I think they're pretty solidly going to at least be in the play in. I don't know. I don't know if the Rockets are going to get on a run to catch them. I just I kind of believe in the the Warriors the, the being the Rockets. Able to. The we don't know what's going on with. I mean, the Rockets are in a world of hurt with Shingun being out. Yeah. Oh my God. That's yeah. I, I didn't quite see exactly what happened. I saw the land in the wheelchair. That's man. That sucks. Yeah. Hopefully injuries. Hopefully it's not a serious injury. But I mean, the it, but the Rockets are on the other side. You're you're going to the other side. We're going to talk about the teams ahead of them. If you're thinking about like right, you have the Pelicans are they've run away from everyone. They're they're they only have 25 losses. These teams have 30 losses. So Sacramento, Dallas, the Lakers possibly phoenix who knows the thing with phoenix cody to keep in mind down the stretch regardless of how you feel about them is i think they have the hardest schedule they have like a ton of away games hmm. right they have a really really difficult schedule to close the year so even though right now phoenix 37 and 27 dallas 36 and 28 and then golden state back at 30 losses like it 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 could get those teams could get shuffled around, but if you're the Warriors, you have to do your part and you have to win. I have no idea if that's possible with Steph Curry out. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that's possible when he's healthy, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. Going back to your point, though, I like I I really want to stick on this this Finals players thing because I don't remember when it was, but do you remember when Draymond Green referred to himself as a 16 game player? Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's like the next level. To, it's the next iteration, right? You could be an 82 game player. You do well in the regular season, 16 games. You play well in the playoffs. But then when we actually get to the fourth round, a fourth round player, so to speak, mm. like what kinds of guys can get minutes there? I think that's so hard to determine. Like what in your mind, if you haven't seen somebody in that sort of scenario, what's the kind of thing you're looking for? Because I, you know, I'm talking about Moses Moody for a second and just all the stuff that he does on the court. I'm like, could Moses Moody find like, could he slice out some minutes to get into a finals game? Yeah. L like, I think so. Like, he's not going to be getting 30-plus minutes a game, but all the stuff that he's doing out there, the physicality that happens in the finals, the defensive flexibility that's necessary, um, I think that's the kind of stuff I'm really looking for. And I think based on all that, sure, like, I think Moses Moody could. Like, Gary Payton II. Uh, it's, by the way, is there anyone, like, that's 6'2 or smaller – I don't even know how tall Gary Payton the second is with like less traditional offensive skills that's able to make himself more valuable than Gary Payton the second. I mean, this guy is just out there crushing people with screens, attacking the offensive glass, rolling to the basket to throw down some pocket passes. It, it's incredible. Like this dude has just completely carved out a role without having a lot of traditional offensive skills. And like, I think that being able to carve out that sort of role is super important to being a finals player. Yeah. Gary Gary Payton the second, he should be studied by scientists because yeah. he's he's like six two, but he's really like six ten, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like a point guard, but he's really a center. Yes, and he's just all of these things at the same time. Yeah, he is like sort of a quantum superposition of, of a basketball player. What 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 did you ask about? I don't even remember. Oh, what do I look for in the finals like player? I'm so glad you asked this question. Okay, cool. I don't know what this episode is about today. I don't know if there's a coherent theme or thought. We're just bouncing all over the place. I think I, I blame the post Oscars malaise on this one. Um, but like, I think it's the same thing I look for at every level of basketball, where this idea of going from college to the NBA, going from Europe to the NBA, going from the NBA to a playoff contention team, going from a playoff contention team to deeper in the playoffs, going from deeper in the playoffs to the finals, like the, the, the decision-making, the sort of feel, the so-called basketball IQ, what, the, what you do on the court with your intelligence, your knowledge, and I'll get into that more in a second. And then you combine that with the physical uh, sort of athletic strength, speed, vertical, length, all those things. 
length is near and dear to my heart because I have these little T-Rex arms. So like I you know, started playing really long, tall dudes at higher levels. They just block my shot all the time. It was terrible. They just block my shot. Um, but that, that's, what I, that's what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for that translation to the next level. And when we talk about this all the time with young players, like trimming the fat, that's a lot of decision-making stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a player like Moses Moody, if you're looking at a player who's in a rotation or on the edge of a rotation, you're not sure, is he going to be a guy who's going to be in a playoff rotation or could he be a finals player? How well is he executing the scheme? How, how much does the coach yell at him? How much does the coach trust him? If you can break down the film and understand what's happening, how often does he miss rotations? Is he the one doing the communicating out there on defense to his teammates or are his teammates telling him where to go and how to get to places on offense. Does he recognize mismatches and he's pointing and he's always in the first place or is he a little confused and he doesn't take advantage of, Oh, there could have been a cut. There could have been a, a dynamic play. You're hit ahead pass situation. Does he understand where to be and how to be there? And it's kind of why I'm fascinated by what happens to Isaiah Joe in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's a great example for Oklahoma city kind of sits on the edge of this rotation might be someone that starts if they shelve Josh Giddy in terms of the shooting, wanting to go to a five shooter lineup. Like, is he a great defender? No. Does he have a lot of like breakdowns and do they seem to trust him? They seem to trust him. He doesn't seem to have a lot of breakdowns. Is he a great, you know, penetrator or athlete? Not really. Does he get bullied and powered and, out athleted and out physicality and like boxed out. No, I don't think so either. So there's like this gray space where someone like that for me sits right there, but it's based on this sort of rubric of like where are the physical advantages and disadvantages that the player creates and where, where's the decision-making knowledge set for when you get into a playoff series and you know, things are going to get pinned down. That's what happens in the playoffs. They, everyone knows everything you're going to do. So Jonathan Kaminga is a cool example of this in the sense that, he literally played in the Warriors championship run when he was like 19, but basically could almost not crack the finals rotation. I don't remember how many minutes he played in the finals. We could look it up, but like you could put him in, in certain situations against teams and his athletic advantage carries over just that burst, the physical, like just an incredible physical, uh, strong dude. But if you don't know the, if you don't know the basic rotation sometimes in January, What's going to happen in a playoff series where like you need to know everyone's tendencies. You need to know exactly how you're going to defend this best player. And, and for the love of God, like you cannot have a breakdown in a big moment there. It's every possession is going to hurt your team. That's the line. That's the sort of approach when I have and, and it applies to everything. It applies from college to pro pro to the next level, pro to the playoffs, playoffs to the finals. It's all the same idea. It's just, how do you create advantages? What do you understand? And who can take that away? I'm thinking of a play, and I'm sure you know it because I think you've been studying this ancient tome of the, the Celtics-Nuggets game from last week for, for eons mm -hmm. at this point. Yes, yes. Uh, but there's a play, I think it's either in the third or fourth quarter, I don't remember, but the Nuggets are doing their little... You describe the th play to me, I'll give you the timestamp on this one. Th they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're doing their little defensive dance. What's it, do you call it next thing? What's your, what's your term that you use it? It's the... I like to call the entire set of rotations the shift. The shift, um, there we are. I've heard it called the full rotation by a lot of coaches. And then the thing you're thinking of, Cody's talking about the this popular thing we talked about last year on a video. When you have the double team, the the next defender over in the passing order in the rotation, he immediately comes to take like if you have a pick and pop and the there's a third defender at the nail or something, he comes over and takes the popper, and then some one of his teammates has to pick up his guy and another guy, and so on and so forth. Yeah, they, they had one of these situations. And Jokic was double teaming, so the rest of them were kind of shifting around so they could defend them. And Did Tatum Porter, have the ball? I don't remember exactly who on the Celtics ends up with the ball, but I do know they swing the ball around. Jokic recovers back to the paint, and Michael Porter Jr. is there. And there's a split second where Michael Porter Jr. is going back to the paint, and Jokic is frantically pointing to the corner. And you can see there's just a moment where Jokic like kind of throws his hands up like, yes, dude, yes. you got to be closing out there a lot faster. And they, they yep. missed the open three, but they gave up a wide open three because of that quick uh, miscommunication. Yes. And that, that would be a great example. Um, and as good as the Nuggets are, I think the Nuggets are the best team in the league at executing these scramble four on three shift next full rotations behind the play. They communicate. They, they are just an incredible unit to watch when they're working together. There's some beautiful possessions. But 
even they won't get it right 100% of the time. It's really hard. And so in the Boston game, they made a couple examples, most of the t- uh, a couple mistakes. Most of the time when they made mistakes in that game, the Celtics actually missed the shots, including what you're talking about. But it's such a precise dance. It's such a fluid, dynamic thing. There's no, like, there are rules, but the rules are guidelines. The rules are read and react. They're not rigid, right? Mm-hmm. They're not like, you always go here. No, you have to read what your teammates are doing and what the players are doing. In fact, in the same game, um, they had a double team with Jokic. Jokic doubles the ball. Aaron Gordon's the doubler. Uh, he, it's Drew Holiday. No, it's, uh, I think, Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum out on the perimeter. Gordon brings the double. When Gordon's double gets there, Jokic peels back off and switches back to someone else. The Celtics have this little like wrinkle counter cool situation where Drew Holiday's in the middle of the paint and and flies out to the three point line like a Sacramento Kings player would like a like I'm hanging out here and it makes it really difficult the the Thunder use these kinds of actions a lot too they lift a player out of the paint as the ball's coming into the paint mm-hmm. makes it really difficult but not for the Nuggets right and Jokic imme- Jokic immediately comes back into the paint, and who tells him where to go? Contavious Caldwell Pope. Hmm. So the fact that you have like KCP is a great defender; he knows what's going on. Jokic is telling people that play you cited. He Jokic knows uh, Porter Jr. needed to be the one to take that read, and by not taking it, the entire house of cards falls down. Aaron Gordon is he communicating in those situations? That's what I'm looking for in these kinds of situations, I think it's, I think it's one of the lesser discussed things that I've seen talked about. But when you, when you get the experience and the knowledge package, just having like, we, we use the expression coach on the floor, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about Draymond Green earlier. The reality is in today's NBA, these players are so smart and so good and so skilled and so experienced that you will have multiple players like this on a team. The more you have, the better, basically. Yeah, and that's a. I don't want to talk about the Celtics too much more, but I feel like the Celtics have a couple of guys that are like that. Especially, I think Drew Holiday is a guy like that. I think that's the value of getting somebody like that on the court, even though you see the diminished like box score types of numbers that's out there. I want to go back to the Thunder for a second because you brought up Isaiah Joe. There's actually another player that I'm interested in because Josh Giddy. I think about the way that he's played when he's on the court, and I feel like we've seen a few times being able to completely play off him, daring him to shoot. And he loses so much of his passing value and whatever else when he's not able to get into sort of the the situations that he wants to be in. And it's tough because theoretically, when you talk about a finals player, I can point to that and say, watch how they defend Josh Giddey. He's not a finals player because teams can do this. But it's actually not about how teams are able to scheme against you. Because no matter who you are, the team's going to be able to scheme against you. When you're in the finals, you're in the playoffs, they're going to spend a lot of time coming up with a specific way that they're going to play you. The question is, is somebody like Josh Giddy going to be able to respond to the scheming that happens? How can he take some of these disadvantages that he's bringing to the court and use it in a way that's actually going to propel him forward and make him a little bit more unschemable. So Josh Giddy, I think, is a really interesting X factor as the Thunder progress throughout the playoffs because I want to see, A, how teams end up defending him, how they start playing against him, and B, how he responds and if he's able to respond and actually show some kind of a value once, they, once the chips are down, Ben. Yeah, we've talked about this before. I'm excited to see this, the cutting, the moving, the spacing, of the offense, I mean, just off the top of my head from film I've seen recently, he's a 30% shooter on his open threes. He'll take some open threes. If he's worse in the playoffs because of the intensity, the pressure, the, the psycholo- you know, the fatigue of def- all that stuff, okay, that's a problem. If he makes 30, 33% in a playoff series, that's fine. He'll sprinkle them in. Then can you cut? Can you cut out of those actions from the perimeter? And the last thing, I already alluded to it, Mark Dagnall, loves to take guys like that and stick them in the dunker spot, stick them on the baseline. And then what does that do? That sends Chet Holmgren out to the perimeter. This is why Chet Holmgren's so good because you can send him out to the perimeter and you don't have a non-shooter out there. You don't have a clunky big. You don't have a vertical big who needs to be in the pick and roll all the time. The guy can play pick and pop. He can play pick and roll. He can initiate the darn offense himself. You can run off ball actions for him and he can flare screen and come off screens. And these are like these subtle little things, Cody, that I feel like 
when we compare players side by side, when we put a microscope on a guy and we say like Chet versus Wemby or Embiid versus Jokic or like that little stuff gets lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. We might do an hour long podcast and we might bring those things up and no one will ever say them again. They're just lost in the shuffle. But the reality is when you think of playoff matchups, when you think of team construction, when you think of the true breadth of skill that someone brings, these are the things that are so valuable because not because of what happens with Chet Holmgren, but because of what happens with someone like Josh Giddy. So I'm fascinated to see um, how that plays out for him in particular, Shea, Isaiah Joe, that Lou Dort. There's a lot going on with the Thunder that, that gets really fun in the playoffs, but it plugs back into this thing of like a finals player. And for me, that's why, like, even though he's 21 years old, like, you know, Chet's like, let's, let's, get, let's bring him on. Go Bear, Jokic, let's bring him on. Let's go. Let's see what happens because not only is he going to be out there, but the question is how competitive is he going to be right now? This is kind of how I feel about Kaysan Wallace, too. Like, this is a rookie. Kaysan. Yes. What did I? Did, did I, <laughs> I don't know how it felt. I get, I get into I, the flow. Some <laughs> syllables get exaggerated. When Kaysan Wallace is out there, Ben, uh, this is a guy that even though he's a rookie, we haven't seen it. I'm like, I don't know. I feel like he can, he can – go with the best of them right like maybe he might get thrown off a little bit I think we saw again going back to that Warriors Kings matchup Keegan Murray looked a little out of sorts the first couple games but I thought by the time the series ended he was looking a lot better I could see the same sort of thing because the skill set that I see from him is a dude that can be a little bit more flexible and bring a little bit more you know physicality and shooting chops and stuff like that I, I really like seeing rookies in the playoffs it's it's always so fun this has been fun I don't know what we talked about today but it was a lot of fun yeah. And uh, if you want to support us, patreon.com slash thinking basketball. That's where we have our stats board that uh, we use to research videos and podcasts and things like that. We have a fun video out on the thinking basketball YouTube channel about how the nuggets are basically the best clutch team uh, in the last decade. We'll, we'll maybe have some follow-up comments on that next week because it's just released as sort of, as we're recording this show here today. Um, did you see Simone Fontecchio's three pointer the other night? The, no. Wait, 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 wait. The bank shot, you know what I'm talking about? The leaning? No. No, I did not. Was it Fontecchio or is it someone else? Wait, are you talking about the game winner? No, there was a some Pistons player made the the goofiest leaning bank shot. I'm going to have to find this now. I only saw it on one of these highlight reels, so I I thought you maybe you would know more about it. No, I didn't see it. I, th I thought you were talking about Max Struess. I know the Dean Wade game's being talked about, but that Max Struess comeback... Uh, I thought that was was that also a Celtics game? Am I making Dean, up a Dean lot of Wade stuff? Dean Wade was the. You're talking about the Max Struess game? Yeah. Right. No, the Max Struess that was a different that was a different team. I, was it? It wasn't against the Celtics, was it? I don't know now. Do you have any other thoughts on what we talked oh. about today? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what did we cover? I, I like this finals players thing. I think this is a, a theory that needs to be fleshed out maybe as we get further. I, I guess in the finals, we could even revisit that. It might even be fun to revisit or figure out teams that don't make the playoffs, like who are the finals players on non-playoff teams, like Jalen Suggs, Ben. Jalen Suggs is just such a finals player. That's a dude that you throw out there. I right, give him 15 minutes, give him this, give him 28 minutes. That dude's going to go out there and just, just do whatever he needs to do, man. How good is Jalen Suggs? Um, I mean, where's the ceiling, Ben? Where's the ceiling? Uh, there's no ceiling. <laughs> Absolutely none. I mean, could you imagine? 40% this year. What if he three. shot like 45% from three? He's shooting 40% from three. Right now he's shooting 40% from three? Yeah, on the season. He's shooting. Okay, you can all listen as I pull up his, his stats. No, think right about now. it. Think about it. Think about it. Jalen Suggs, 45% three-point shooting. He's 22 years old. He's he's in the 48th percentile on drives. What if he cranked that up to 99th percentile? What if he was like 70% on his drives? Uh, thanks, thanks as always for listening to this one all the way through. And uh, we, of course, as always, hope you are having a great day. <laughs>